Good evening, everyone. Hello. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amali, and I'm the events coordinator here at Books on Magic. So before we get started, I just wanted to point out a few logistics about how tonight's going to go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on at all times while at this event. Uh, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end, so please start thinking of questions to ask now. And after the talk, Lee will be signing and personalizing books at the desk behind me near the side door. And of course, we have additional books available for purchase from my colleagues Isabel and Shamade in the back. If you're joining us virtual uh, or virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of Nobody Gets Out Alive online using the link in the live stream description. All right, so with all that in mind, we're very excited to introduce Lee Newman and Chris Beha, who are here yeah. so great. into the remote, unsettled wilderness, bringing to life best friends, sisters, and single moms by getting, getting by in this raw and beautiful landscape. We aren't the only ones excited to see this book on our shelves. Nobody Gets Out Alive was named a most anticipated book by Vogue, Literary Hub, The Millions, Good Housekeeping, Oprah Daily, and more. Lee Newman is the author of Still Points North, a memoir about growing up in Alaska, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Prize. Her stories have appeared in Harper's, The Paris Review, Tin House, Mick Sweeney's Quarterly Concern, One Story, and Electric Literature. In 2020, she was awarded the Paris Review's Terry Southern Prize, a Best American Short Story, a Pushcart Prize, and an American Society of Magazine Editors Prize for her work in the Paris Review. Oh, what a bio. <laughs> and as I mentioned before, Lee is joined in conversation with Chris Beha, who is the editor of Harper's Magazine. His most recent novel, which is also available for purchase tonight, the Index of Self-Destructive Acts was nominated for the 2020 National Book Award. So without any further delay, please join me in welcoming me and Chris. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is my first bookstore event since 2019, I think. It's very exciting. Uh, this is definitely, I think this is my first bookstore event since like 2015. <laughs> I didn't even think it's wonderful. I mean, yeah. I've moderated a couple. Yeah. Oh, wait, I forgot. I did one last week. Okay, but yeah. I was <laughs> but it's so great. We, we really appreciate having you all here. And we've got like an, an overflow crowd and a good uh, uh, home court crowd, I feel like. It's a friendly crowd. So we're going we're gonna to do well here. Um, I'm so excited to be talking with you about this book, which I love so much. Um, and I read most of these stories as they were being published individually. I had the great privilege of publishing one of them myself, um, but now I've read them together uh, as a collection and was just stunned by the way that they all hold together. Um, and I wanted to start by talking about how this came to be as a book, by that process. You had written a lot of nonfiction and very right. successfully so, yeah. and then Right around the time that we first met, you were starting to publish these stories. And I remember there was like a lot of buzz about these wonderful stories being published. And I don't know, tell me about uh, how this originated. Um, well, I, 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 I was writing short stories in grad school, so, and that sadly was like 20 years ago. Um, no, it was, yeah, it was, it was 20 years ago. And um, I remember writing stories in grad school and loving, to, like learning how to write language within the stories, but I could never figure out how to write the story itself. And I remember, sometimes I'm just going to call, since I know every single person in this room, I'm going to call some people out. I remember talking to Hannah Tinty, and she published one of my stories in one story, and I, I, I pulled off that story, but I did not know what I was doing. It was like, the fact that I got to an ending and I was able to do it um, was just kind of like feeling around the dark. And... Um, so after I published my memoir, I've been writing. Uh, I I turned to nonfiction um, after writing fiction for a while, not liking what I was doing. Um, and when I turned back to it, I thought, "Oh, I'm so annoyed that I could not pull off a story with authority. I'm so just. I'm so upset with myself. I am still frustrated. Oh, I remember why I quit writing fiction. <laughs> but this time I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try a lot harder." 
And I tried to write a novel, and I would kept quitting. I'd get about 100 pages in, and I'd be like, I really don't care. Then I started writing the story that you published, Nobody Gets Out Alive, and I was writing about this mastodon skull, which was in this living room, which actually is a real thing. It is at a friend's of mine's house, has this huge mastodon in the middle of this living room. That's the only like real part of that story. Um, and I had written other stories with this technique of looking at something really interesting. Like one old story that I loved was about Osage oranges, um, which were in another hometown of mine in Baltimore. And I remember moving from Alaska to Baltimore and there was these brains all over our yard. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this short story that I did love. Um, and I feel like everything together <laughs> came in that story, but it wasn't like book worthy. I don't know why, but the technique was to look at something in your life to the point that you become so mesmerized and you have people starting to react around it. And mm -hmm. so once I had the mastodon I could write about in the right way, then I, all the characters were tripping over the mastodon or they were touching the mastodon. I knew I was going to have somebody in the corner. They were going to be a little bit like me. Like, what the hell am I doing in this party? I'm just going to, you know, pet the mastodon. And I think that story started with at least three or four pages of him just petting the mastodon <laughs> and just talking about the bone and do you know what it looked like and and then I think somewhere in that process I was like I don't think I'm telling a story again I think I'm just writing and having fun but I gotta get my act together and have people doing things and have them reacting to each other because that's called storytelling <laughs> not just obsessing you know and, uh, <laughs> Come on, you guys have had these conversations <laughs> with yourself. <laughs> You've been like, walking around is not exercise. <laughs> so then I so then I actually started telling the story, and then I had to cut back a lot of that obsession. And then at some point I was like, I'm not gonna I was writing the story in the backyard of my apartment on third place, which is right down the street. And I'm we had a shed there, and by shed I mean a real shed. It wasn't a deluxe thing. And actually, there was a possum living in it. And several times, I'd be like writing at four in the morning, and I'd be like typing away. And the possum would come in, who had laid his babies in this trunk I had, thinking that it would be a fun place to put the kids' costumes. And they would go into the shed and make plays. <laughs> Look at my children. Instead of playing video games, and instead a possum came and laid its babies there. And um, I would be like typing away, and it would go. <laughs> Seriously, this all happened, but I was like, "You're not leaving the shed until we have if a story." I can jump in. Yeah, I just had a possum in my yeah, backyard. Yeah, they're two blocks everywhere, away from and they're me. horrible. This is, this is a thing. Yeah, I mean, they're yeah. like really horrible yeah. looking and scary. I called city animal control, and they laugh at you. They were like, "We don't really deal with possums or squirrels." Yeah, and I was like, "This is not a squirrel. No, don't yeah. make me feel like I'm calling you a squirrel." It was squirrel. awful. Yeah, it was a real war. It okay. But that's another story. That's what we're here to talk but about. But that right? actually <laughs> illustrates the technique, right? You obsess about the possum and then it becomes a war, right? And we yeah. headed out. But I really wanted to finish it. And I um, I would not let myself leave the shed until that happened. But that, you know, took a, I would get up and take the kids to school and then I'd come back and keep focusing on it. And um, I remember when I got to the end, because once I am able to start telling the story, then it's very easy for me. Once I get like the first five or six pages laid down, the next 20 happen in about 25 minutes, like really quickly, because I can almost like, the story's off and galloping and all I have to do is just keep getting it down. And I think I learned something about that story about too, about endings, like that an ending is often talking to the beginning. And when I was able to figure that nut out, and in different ways that the ending will talk to the beginning in all kinds of different ways. In this way, the Macedon um, turns up again, right? Or uh, his brother, these tusks um, that they're giving away. But um, now I always don't have to worry about getting to the ending because I know there'll be something in the beginning. It won't necessarily be the thing I've highlighted, but something in the beginning or even the middle will be, be there for me to pick up and bring later. And then you... Did you did you know when you would finish this? Absolutely, like, this is really I fucking good. knew I totally one hundred percent. I was like, yeah. I am the stupidest person <laughs> in the world. I'm gonna write a book of short stories, not a novel, not a TV show. <laughs> I'm writing a book, and I was like, and I'm gonna ha I'm gonna do it until they're all perfect. Yeah. And I I'm gonna do it until they're all perfect, and they all have to feel like novels. And I also 
really felt free because um, I had grown up with like Raymond Carver stories in grad in college, and I'd been around of like a lot of minimalist writers. Um, who were doing way more experimental things, and I'd hung around with like Gordon Lish crowd young men in my twenties, and I always felt like such a um, like I would I didn't even I didn't understand what they were doing, but I wanted to be them, which is like the worst yeah. scenario that you can put up for yourself as a twenty five year old or whatever. Um, and and I felt like I'd finally left all that kind of tastefulness aside, and then I was going to be like just so lavish and so tasteless and just like slam a bunch of adjectives together and make these like thick elaborate like a mastodon sentences. Yeah, kind of like yeah. yeah, I wanted it to be really thick and I started seeing through to the language too that like I didn't want these like little holes of uh and I didn't want any weak spots in a sentence. And so it felt um it's just freeing and almost maybe a little bit um naughty. Um, to use ah. adverbs in that way, you know, <laughs> really it did. I was like, oh, I'm using an adverb. I'm using four adjectives. I'm like, I'm using alliteration like seven times in this paragraph, and I'm gonna, and 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 I'm. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. It was great. Well, it's it's funny that you mentioned uh, you brought up authority and feeling like this story because yeah. to me that's how this reads. It just reads like a writer is so much in command of what she's doing and what she's trying to do and there's just like the kind of uh as a reader when you when you step into a book and feel like oh she really knows what she's doing there's uh -huh. such it's you feel like safe as a reader i'm gonna really get something out of it she's uh -huh. not messing around with me she's gonna there's gonna be a point and I, I i don't know it's just uh from the first story you're just like <laughs> she really knows what she's doing well i think once you get the one like section of voice, like where it's, and that was in the story that you published, then I was able to make, I would actually made a lot of rules for myself, technical rules, since I know you guys, I'm just gonna talk about craft, okay? If nobody knew what this book was, I would sit here and try and sell you on all the Alaska wonderful stories. <laughs> but can we just talk about writing a little bit? Cause um, I would like to. Um, I set up a lot of technical challenges that like I wanted to have young girls and old women and I wanted to have young men and old men and I wanted to be writing in a variety of voices and then I also wanted to do things like with the middle story which is that novella which really I'm cool. calling a story and let's face it it's 65 pages um, and it's about five different people fleeing um, the US for Alaska in 1975 driving up the Alcan and some of them are in pretty dire straits, actually, and some of them are not. Um, in that story, for example, the whole idea was there would be a we voice, then an I voice. I mean, there was an I voice, and then there would be a we voice, and then there would be a you voice, and then there would be a, um, um, well, I would turn it into a letter. That was my way of pretending that was a different point of view, but really, no. Uh, <laughs> if I'd been smarter of an omniscient, and then, a, and then an I voice at the end. Um, the we voice is the voice of two best friends. Um, who are young women and, and they're um, traveling to Alaska for adventure and for fun and excitement and like trying to leave their past behind as like good girls and they run into some not very good women. <laughs> Although I love, I love that mother. Um, I, it was like a kind of like a artistic and emotional um, challenge you know or a game well, i was playing the, with myself the, the stories are all very formally different yeah which is you know mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel like you're 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 trying to be experimental as you said no i'm not no i'm trying to get to the truth like a lot of themes you know yeah. that, that run across the stories characters and the setting and yeah. all that that, that run across the stories but it does feel like each time you're trying to find a form for this story and this exactly I'm trying about. to find a voice I'm trying to find a form and I'm trying to find some and I'm not joking like scraping truth because like the three things I always say that I care about in writing is you know I you do want those beautiful sentences but I wrote a lot of beautiful sentences before this book and I don't think they added, necessarily added up to what I'd hoped for and then storytelling I just love that there's an actual story I'm not an idea person. You know, I'm, I can't play chess, and I can't! <laughs> I really never, I graduated with, like, so many degrees <laughs> from college, but, like, I never really read any criticism because I would just kind of glaze over and go take a nap. Um, 
I do love story, but also I really, um, like I do think of writing as a vocation. And it's, I know that we were talking about spirituality on the sidewalk. Yeah. That has a lot to do with what I'm trying to get to about, um, you know, the human condition and, and, and what we struggle with. And I didn't want the stories, I didn't realize it, but as I would write them, they would not have these grim nihilistic endings the way that it's, other writers are very good at. Um, there was always someone who did something unexpectedly, because that's been my experience, actually, is that, you know, even someone who's done like 99% of the time done really horrible things, there'll be that one day where, you know, they turn around and do something different. And, and that's what I find surprising about humans, and that's what I was trying to, like, capture, yeah. is love. I, I knew that I could not do hate. I right. could only do love. Um, and yet there's, there's a lot of violence in the yeah. book. There's a lot of, yeah. you know, people hurting other people, and, and people in relationships hurting other people, and imperfect relationships. Um, but, but there is this, this under, it doesn't feel nihilistic. No. I mean, I guess that's been my experience. I have never been in a perfect relationship. Um, and I grew up in a, like, a lot of chaos. I mean, the parts of this book that are true are less like, so each story is written on a lake that I invented called Diamond Lake. And it bears an uncanny resemblance to the lake that I grew up on in Alaska, um, which is an anchorage. And... It's a lot of people who have made their own money, moved to Alaska for adventure, they bought a plane or a helicopter, and um, there's significant drinking, and there's significant opioid crisis issues, and there's significant weaponry, and there's significant domestic violence, which is a huge thing that goes on in Alaska all the time. And I've said this before, but like, at many of the times I was growing up, Alaska was like 56% um, male. Um, and that was like in the populated parts. Like sometimes you'd go to certain places. I've been to towns like King Salmon, and it was a really rough tumble town. It's not in this book, but um, we had a house there to be like 90% men. And there I was at like 16 years old with my dad, like wandering around, you know. Um, and 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 the atmosphere was um, intense, you know. And it was like actually it was pretty scary. And my dad would be like, don't touch her. Like, my dad would literally, like, go down the street, like, don't look at her, don't touch her. Don't look at her, don't touch her. I have, I have a firearm. You know, like, that was implicit, actually. Um, and he'd be like, get in the house. It, it was real, like, the frontier, but I, what I, that was so much of what I was trying to talk about, too, is I feel like there's this beautiful um, canon of frontier literature that features women like Laura Ingalls Wilder and Maya Tania from 100 years ago. And then I just felt like everything I was reading about the West or the frontier um, when I was, you know, growing up was like, guys, cowboy type of guys, drunk in Montana. Mm -hmm. These are great stories. I love them. They're just, I'm not there. Right. And they're like drinking beer and shooting elk. And, um, and I would always like love these stories. And it took me like 15 years to be like, I do love these stories, but literally there are no women in them. And I want to be the woman telling the stories. I'm going to take them all back now. Um, and I'm going to put them, that Western canon in Alaska, because I do feel like it's still the frontier there. And right. especially when I grew up there. It was the frontier. Like, we had no cell phones. We had no sat phones. Like, if you got stranded in your airplane, you know, nobody was coming to get you. And that actually happened to us a lot of times. I mean, yeah. So, um, I kind of wanted to, and I wanted to bring back women who can fish and hunt and hike and show the complexities of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, do you want to read a little bit? I do. Okay. I do. I don't, um, am I supposed to bring, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, um, I'm really lucky, I'm just going to say this before I start to read, because three of my editors are here. Wait, my editor of my book, editor of One Story, Hannah Tinty, <laughs> Emily is here from the Paris Review, Chris is here from Harper's. I was so, Kathy is here from my book. Um, I was so lucky to have, and then you know what? Actually, Fiona Mazel is like one of the few people I trusted to show that first story. I don't know where she is. She also edited me. Um, and I remember being so afraid when I sent her that story. No one had seen it. And, and, I, and she knew how insecure I was. And she wrote me an email and said, oh, you're doing it. You're good. And I, I almost peed my pants. <laughs> Keep going. That's all. You know, people just need to say keep going. Then you can go. 
Um, okay, so I wanted to read this third story, which is, you know, it came out today in electric literature, and Emily wrote this beautiful introduction to it, and it's one of my favorite stories, and um, I just think it's, a lot of you might have read Nobody Gets Out Alive, the title story in Harper's, or you might have read How Palace. Um, but I don't think many people have read this story, and it's like my little, it's like my little um, sister, and I'm taking her to the party. Um, and actually, it is about sisters. My sister is in town and wants to meet. I pick up, I pick Suite 100 for its wide selection of French varietals and its convenient location on the B55 People Mover. The People Mover pulls up late as usual. The seats are filled. The aisles blocked with crutches, broken sacks of clothing, and for the first time, a dog. It's a big dog with a big craggy head resting like a boulder of teeth on the mat. How it got past the driver, I have no idea. The girl holding on to him is not blind, but seems to have achieved a dazzling chemical distance from the rest of our fellow passengers. Despite her painful looking dreads, she leans against the window, bewitched by the starless purple sky and the bright palaces of commerce that line Diamond Boulevard. I sit down next to her just to be closer to the dog. He is the mottled color of tortoiseshell. A strand of frothy drool dangles from his lower lip. The girl nods off and a few stops later rests her head on my shoulder. She smells of poop and wood smoke and sticky raspberry brandy. I breathe through my mouth and try to straighten up a little to keep her head from lolling back and whipping, whiplashing her awake. Her eyelids flutter. The whites are ragged with broken red. Fred Meyer slides by, then Alaskan reindeer sausage factory, lost margaritas with its thatched roof and neon fajita fajita sign. The girl smiles faintly through an opioid flavored dream. The dog pants on my ankles. I sneak a pet on his head. A gust of diesel heat blows down the aisle, then a silver gum wrapper. October is a slow, snowless month in Anchorage but colder than anyone ever expects. People use the people mover as a floating motel until service ends at 9 p.m., which I did not know until I lost my license for a wet and reckless the previous summer. This was a lucky turn of events, Dad says, considering the current proclivity of local judiciaries to declare cases such as mine as DUIs with mandated jail time. His opinion, a wet and reckless in 2014 just isn't what it used to be back in the days of the real Alaska, when guys used to cruise down Northern Lights Boulevard with a 12-pack in their cab, tossing beers to promising young ladies at stoplights. Most of my lucky turn of events, however, was fabricated by his rabidly diligent lawyers. I don't mind not having a car, not really. There is something almost cozy about being driven where you need to go, with no other responsibility except to hold up a girl's head and push the button to get off. I would not mind staying on the people mover tonight. It's almost tempting. I'm a little afraid of my sister. At the old shutdown borders, I look in my purse, but there is no money. I'm not allowed money. Only mom's Amex. I stick it in the girl's pocket. Maybe she will find it and use it to buy herself dinner and a bag of kibble. <laughs> Should I go a little more? Suite 100 is located in a boxy, low-rise complex next to a vision clinic and a podiatrist pra practice. <laughs> the windows are tinted, and the entrance is a hallway lined with rental plants and a framed listing of professional tenants. I click past all this, pleased as always by the official sound of my heels on the tile, and pull open the door. Other than the missing treasure chest and the receptionist's desk, the decor of the wine bar still looks like the dentist office it formerly was a muted assortment of chairs and tables, inoffensive lighting. A few men wait at the bar, peering into voluminous glasses of Cabernet, as though an ancient highlights crossword might surface from the depths. On a hook by the hostess hangs a key attached to an awkward hunk of driftwood, presumably meant to keep you from misplacing it on the journey to the bathroom. The hostess is missing, and the tables are mostly empty, except for a few women with tasteful sunsets of eyeshadow over each eye. They sit by the fireplace, bronzed in the clingy light. At least one is familiar to me. High school, cotillion, Girl Scouts, Katie, Kirsten, Carlene. There's something familiar about her spray-on tan, her charm bracelet, her hesitant way of crossing her legs. The most reassuring part of dropping out of the Anchorage elite is that you no longer have to remember who was who or the last time you forgot it. 
You can just smile and nod slightly as if you are on your way to pick up your free bouquet of flowers on the other side of the room. This is my method and tonight it's easier than most. I'm swaddled head to heels in creamy beige cashmere stolen from my stepmother's latest Neiman Marcus mail order shipment. My sister Jamie waves me over. She has taken an expansive leather booth for six or more all for herself. She does this everywhere we meet, but this time she has a reason. She is pregnant, indisputably so, overflowing onto the table. Don't get up, I say, and slide in next to her. She smells of cocoa butter and the faintest whiff of morning sickness. I can't help it. I reach for her stomach. It is so warm, so firm. As if on command, a dense lump of baby heaves up from under her skin, the size and shape of a tiny head. I follow it with my hand and meet my sister's hand, and when all three of us are stacked up like this, me, Jamie, the baby, the whole world seems to go quiet, beautiful, glazed with the kind of understanding we used to have, back when we could still look at each other and know without a word or a peek into each other's cupped fingers that we had both chosen identical butterscotch candies from the bowl on the bank lady's desk. <laughs> You're amazing, I say. You're going to be a mom. I'm already a mom, says Jamie, which is true, but slightly painful. Her three-year-old daughter, Jude, lives with her and her wife, Flora, in Portland, Oregon. I have never met them or seen their blue bungalow covered in wild sea roses, except on Instagram. Jamie refuses to bring her family up to Anchorage, and I can't leave mom by herself for more than a few hours. We let go hands, and Jamie begins to cry. Her tears are loose, silent, runny. They go on for a while. She doesn't even rub them off with her napkin. According to my memory, which is not always the most reliable, Jamie doesn't cry in front of other people. She also doesn't eat pineapple, sleep on her stomach, or talk to mom, except in the presence of dad, and even then, she won't look at her. I can come back, says the waitress. She is older than us with a faint white scar down her cheek that I like to think is from a tabby cat who did not mean to scratch her, mm -hmm. but that is so clean, so precise on its edges, it implies only a knife. My sister and I had a babysitter with a similar scar on her face. Her name was Fern. When I think of Fern, I think of mom. When I think of mom, I worry that she is trying to do something ambitious, like trying to make popcorn on the stove instead of in the microwave. We have an agreement about this, but it's not exist, exist, as if I'm exactly stringent about the rules. A bottle of Stag's Leap, 1997, says my sister, still crying. The cask's 23. The waitress glances at her baby bump. We have tests in the restroom, she says, free of charge. This is the most recent idea of a local city councilman who retrofitted the tampon machines in local bars to dispense two-minute pregnancy tests. A record-setting number of babies are born in our state with fetal alcohol syndrome. Drunk women are supposed to go into a stall, pee, and if a plus sign pops up, stop drinking. <laughs> there are potent mysteries in this logic, such as what women do when panicked. I am not the genius in our family. Dad and my sister Jamie vie for that, but I do have a terrible feeling that if you were to graph the number of Jaeger shots, Against the number of positive pee sticks in the bathroom floor, you might end up with a data set of rapidly escalating birth defects. <laughs> the wine is for her, my sister says, pointing to me. I'm not drinking. I look at her again, confused. My sister never lets me drink, and besides, my license has a do not serve line through it, one of the unavoidable downsides of a wet and reckless. Over by the fireside, laughter, more laughter. The waitress glances at the sunsets as I na name the group with the eyeshadow. The woman next to the woman whose name I can't remember mouths silently to the waitress, crab cakes, <laughs> then holds up her empty glass, Merlot. Anything else, the waitress says to my sister? <laughs> Just the bottle. She blows her nose. And why the fuck not? A dozen oysters. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of my favorites in the collection as well. Um, you, one thing that just gets mentioned in passing there is this idea of um, the old Alaska, the father saying it's not like yeah. you know, how it used to be. But that's that that's sort of a continual 
theme throughout the... Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's partly because I obviously don't live in Alaska, although I go spend a lot of time there, and like, when you're from there. So a lot of the stories actually were written in Alaska. I usually go up for a month, and that's where I finish my work. Like, I'll start the stories here, but I would never finish one here. I don't know why, but that's not going to happen. Um, but I do think there's this huge contrast, and one story that I, I do want to go back to, I haven't finished it yet, um, is, like, how much the state has changed, um, you know, from what they think of as the glory days of the pipeline. When there was just, everyone was building a pipeline, and there was like cocaine everywhere, and there was like, if you were like a stripper, you could make like $100,000 a year in 1970, and everybody was, you know, if you were not even talented and you opened like a donut shop, you were gonna make a million dollars, because there was no donuts. <laughs> you know, like seriously, there was, there was no chain stores. We didn't get chain stores till like 2014. And um, when I was a kid, you had to fly to Seattle. Like, well, the rich kids did. I did not go to Seattle. My dad would have been like, here's $25, go a pair of Levi's. He actually did do that. He'd be like, here's $25, go to J.C. Penney's and get some Levi's. Um, but fancy kids got to go to Seattle. Um, where is my point? So as all of these people have moved up, the culture has changed. And also, I think people are coming for different reasons. Like... There was, when I was a kid, like a real, like, frontier kind of craziness. You know, like, I remember, like, my dad being like, we're going to land on the ocean. And I was like, you know, I think we all thought in the plane, like, not a good idea. Like, there were all these whales that were surfacing, and we went and flew the airplane out of our house. Our house was on a lake, and right next to what's called Cook Inlet. And Cook Inlet is, like, 54 degrees. It's got the strongest, second strongest tides in the world, outside of um, Japan, and He's like, we're like, look, at, we always used to go around and look at the belugas surfacing before we went off to go fishing or something. And he's like, it looks really calm. Let's land. So he landed the plane. I mean, this was the dumbest idea. The swells were like eight feet. You know, we were like facing walls of water with an airplane. Like, he was like, shit, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, we, I, he somehow got us that he was cursing and throwing things. And we landed. We took off onto a wave and flew away. But I don't think people do that kind of thing no. anymore. I think they're smarter. I think there are um, more rules. Um, we just had no rules. And did, did you have a sense of, like, this is different than how it is in other places? I or had just no like, this is normal life? idea. I had no idea. Um, and I remember when I, before I became a, a writer of books, I wrote a lot of travel articles. And I remember the first time, like, Somehow I sat down with my editor, and the first story I ever did is I went and lived with the Samis um, on the Arctic Circle of Norway. Um, oddly enough, I'd given her a short story that was my only clip, and I was the fact checker. She's like, well, you like Alaska. Why don't you go to Norway? And I traveled with them. Um, and they're kind of a tight, tight-knit um, community because they've been sort of exploited by... Um, uh, uh, many, many Europeans. <laughs> it's really theirs. So they rejected the Germans. There were some German guys trying to travel with them, and they would not let them. They let me. Um, and I sat down with my editor, and I was trying to tell her, like, a little bit about Alaska, and she's like, you should write a book. And I remember thinking, and I said, well, who, who, who would, ca you know, you have to have something really cool happen to you. Right. You know, and I, I couldn't conceive, because I think that's what happens. We grow up, we think how we grow up is how everybody grew up. If you have an alcoholic in the family, you think everybody grew up like that. If you have, um, you know, five dogs, you think everybody grew up with all these animals. And I think that's why, like, people who have big families have big families. Like, right. some way we replicate what yeah. we're doing. It's, it's I, I feel like a huge thing for, uh, for a writer is finding what your material is. Yeah. And very often it is, like, the thing that is closest to home. You know, it's yeah. like the thing you have that no one else has. Like, you do have to look close to home. But, but... Almost no young writer does that, and you do like yeah. like that 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 desire to be like a Gordon Lishite, and I'm gonna. Write oh these, my God! I wrote stories about the Los whatever, Angeles yeah. suburbs. I have never really lived in the suburbs, <laughs> and I would write all these stories about things I did not know what I was talking yeah. about. I mean, there's suburbs in Alaska, and that's you know, but that's a different kind of suburb. Like that's a suburb with a moose in it, and a suburb where your driveway cracks every year, and a suburb where you know you have to plug in your car every night or your car's gonna freeze. And it's like, you, you, you look at this book now, and it's like, of course that's your material. Yeah, you know, I know. But, Boy, but do I feel dumb that I wasted all that time. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like an idiot. <laughs>
But but presumably you wouldn't have been able to twenty years ago to do with this material no. what you did now. No, yeah. I, I don't think so. Um, I also know that there are people, and I love these people, where like they make a plan and then they execute it, and it turns out really well. I was just talking about this with someone on our staff at Zabie Books whose name's Jonique, and she like executed the plan. But that's not me. I'm more like, this looks good, I'll go over here. Or this person brought this strawberry, I'm going to eat it. And okay, I really like strawberries, now I eat strawberries all the time. Um, that's not really... I don't, I'd love to plan, but I think actually that might ruin the whole journey for me. It's just like writing stories. I do not write an outline. I do not plan anything. I just try and get that first paragraph tight, and then I can go. Um, but did you, after you finished the first story, and you sort of thought, okay, this is going to be a collection, was there any planning then about what this, what stories were going to be next? Because there's things like, yeah. you know... The, the, the last story yeah. has this historical bit that includes kind of the, the founding of Anchorage and also the creation of the Diamond Lake that yeah, everything yeah. else is set on. Was that a conscious, like, no. I'm going to, this this needs that kind of capstone? Or... No. I actually just really had always read about the history of Anchorage, which was supposed to be called Alaska City. And there was this big barge parked in Anchorage, and it was the post office. And even though the whole town voted to, for it to be called Alaska City, the federal government rode over them and said it'll be called Anchorage after this boat, which was the post office. And um, I always thought, wow, um, I'm going to write this story called Alaska City. Obviously, that was, that was the plan, um, but it didn't happen. And I think I just started like thinking about that tent city, and I kind of made up everything in that story. There's almost, I think, you know, all the, the terms and everything, I just made them up. Um, but as you write it, right, and then I'd be like, oh, Remember Janice from story two? Of course she's going to pop up here at the dinner party and tell off somebody and like give a blowjob to some guy. And, oh, I'm sorry, my children are here. Do something inappropriate. <laughs> Very inappropriate. Um, and, you know, because you're picking up the people. I think right. it's a lot of what I was talking about, like starts the beginning, the ending talks to the beginning, but also the stories are talking to each other because I'm having that conversation. But none of it was planned from the outset. Yeah. I, I have some characters who overlap between my books, and it's like, um, uh, I actually, I, I heard Phil Broth talk about being like a, a baseball manager with a bullpen. Yeah. He's like, I know I have those people, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, maybe I should like call in Zuckerman for this one, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, yeah. it's like, all of a sudden you need a character to play a particular role, and you're like, oh, well, I've already got well, someone. Well, I guess so, I kind of fall in love with them. Like, in the first story when I wrote it, so Janice, you know, is the wife. So the first story is about this couple and they go to their wedding party and things go really badly because the bride begins to flirt with the host of the party instead of her husband. So the host's wife is named Janice. And the minute I saw her in the bathroom, I knew she was going to come up in a lot of things. I think she was the first person I carried over. And I knew that Karina would come over I, um, um, just because... Um, I think I identify with her a little bit more than other people as myself, even though we have nothing in common. But I, I somehow knew I could make her... I want to also know what happened to her as a child that made her so um, kind of closed off. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that, that impulse in your work is, is amazing, that, that compassion, which is you, when, when you said that in the middle story you loved that mother. Of course, the mother, you know, without any spoilers, does... Yeah, truly the the worst thing. That yeah, a, that she a does a lot of do. yeah. Um, uh, but uh, you're so committed to to trying to figure out what kinds of experiences lead someone to be in this position where they do this thing, that then of course after the fact you would just sort of say, well, that's an unforgivable thing to do. Um, yeah. And so so it's it feels to me like a lot of the a lot of the stories the the kind of uh, narrative logic of the story is. Uh, seeing a person in a particular position and, and almost inviting the reader to judge that person in a particular way and then over the course of the story making you understand how it is that that person wound up in that position. I do love that you said that as a reader and that's one of those things where a reader's going to be able to understand what I'm doing better but I know that myself I'm trying to figure that person out. I'm trying to unpack like why would um, why why would she hit her son in the parking lot? And have, and you know that feeling like when you see these kind of moments? Um, I think that's like deeply personal for me, actually. Um, 
it feels not at all um, strategic. It feels um, like almost like acting or being in the being in the movie, mm -hmm. getting to be in the movie. Um, you know how like sometimes you put your headphones on, and you're like, I'm walking down the street, I'm in a music video. <laughs> you know, you feel like really great, and then you look at yourself in the mirror, you're like, oh my god, what happened? But I feel like when I'm in the story like that, then it's just, um, like, it's, it's, it's just like being in the movie. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, uh, in the, I guess, the second to last story, which yeah. the, the Claire, um, yeah. she has this thought about uh, mothers in particular, coming to her and having this question which is that like am i really this person that i yeah. see in the mirror or yeah. am i the person that it feels like i am on the inside yeah you know? well this is a story and this was another thing is that i wanted to try and write a non-realistic story and so i wrote one about a fortune teller it's called our family fortune teller and i invented this whole kind of um um not true uh mythology about people called claire's like a clairvoyant, but with the word Claire, just that word, and then not everyone's a non-Claire. So Claire's can know what you, um, what you know. They can't know what you feel, and they can't um, know your every thought. They just know what you know, but you can't say out loud. So it was really, I w really was writing in response to uh, several other writers that I had read, like Sean Vestal, who wrote Godforsaken Idaho. Fabulous fiction with straight realistic fiction that I should just try one since I've never written a fabulous that was a challenge um, but then I always came back to all so all of her clients are mothers and all these women come um, and reveal like their struggles about their kids and she's trying to help them and another thing that she does is that she cooks for them which um, I took from Freud because Freud used to cook meals for his um, clients in order to make them bond and love them and so she's like this old crone who's living in this broken down shack and all these rich mothers come who have these, you know, problem children and a lot of opioid addictions and they're trying to sort things out. And it's not very, um, and she kind of ministers them in this way. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful story. I, I thought a lot about when reading that. Uh, David Means, a great, great, great short story oh, writer. Oh, that is he ever. Yeah. Uh, said, said to me something... And he says he, he, he said this first, and then and yeah. then uh, Jonathan Franzen stole it from him. But in any case, he yeah. said that the, the, the hot decor, the thing that is too hot to touch, yeah. that's the thing you have to like go straight for as a as as a writer. And and I I was thinking in that story that it's, it's it's these what these women have is they have some some deep secret, some sort of shameful secret, and they want it to be known by other people. But yeah. they do not actually want to tell it. What they want is for yeah, some. that's exactly and, right. And I feel like a lot of the fiction writing impulse comes from that. You supplement. You have some secret. Yeah, you don't for sure. Tell it. You don't want to be responsible for having told it. Um, that's what also I like writing about fiction. Betray I could, the people. Who yeah, I have all these like array of jewels in my life that I would never write about it in nonfiction. And then I can take it and then I can turn it and put it and drop it into place. I remember the feeling of relief. You know, even that beginning of story that I just read I remember when I was thinking about I was writing directly towards this purple snow month no this month in October when I was living in Anchorage and actually my friend was dying and um I went my my girl that I have a lot of beautiful but like um tragically fraud friends up there and they this girlfriend said oh come over and come to this party and I had to get my um I had to go to the airport and I was really bummed out and it was a bunch of ding-dongs over there. And they were like, you know, 35 years old and like doing keg stands. And a bunch of guys, we were the only two girls there. And I was like, this reminds me of high school. And I actually said to her, this is why I left the state. <laughs> yeah. And then the guys were too drunk and I didn't have a car. How was I going to get there and get to the airport? Well, I wasn't going to miss my plane. My kids were there. So um, I was like looking at bus schedules. This was before Uber mm -hmm. when it was not reliable. And it's still not very reliable in Alaska. The Uber driver will just be like, I don't feel like getting you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the frontier spirit. Uh, and I had to get a taxi. And as I pulled out, I was so relieved because I couldn't handle this like um, drunken. I don't know what that was. A bunch of guys. I just couldn't take it. And I like unrolled the taxi window, and I was really sad about my friend dying. And it was so purple. The the sky is so purple in uh, Alaska. And I think it was the end, like right towards Halloween. It was the day before Halloween. And it started to snow. And like all this little snow started falling and blowing into the cab. And I was like, I'm free. 
I mean, it was so beautiful, and I, it was so beautiful um, that that I think actually that was why I put it on the bus. Um, do we have questions in the audience? Most of you know me. There's nothing you can't ask. <laughs> so you said the first paragraph is important. Is that a Lish residual? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it was. Actually, um, Gordon Lish was always like, think about that first sentence and what are you going to do with it? And uh, that part really stuck with me. I mean, I learned a lot of things from people like, it's your opening gambit. And um, I think there are a number of short story writers that write, like I... Elizabeth the Kraken does it. I don't know where she learned that too, but if you open up like any of her collections, those first sentences are always like dazzling and strange. There'll be a mystery in them. There'll be a lot of language work. Um, and I've learned to move it off of the object and sometimes onto situation, like my wife Meryl was having an affair, and then move into the object. So sometimes you can start with the situation, but it's got to have some a lot of composition in it and a jump off. Hello. Richard. Mm -hmm. I remember going to those Gordon Lish things with you. Yeah. <laughs> since it's way back in the day. But anyway, my question is, speaking of composition, you're saying all these beautiful things about uh, form. Like, what, when you're writing these, like, what other art forms were? Is I thought a lot about music, yeah. and I listened, especially, um, I would wanted to make a playlist, but I kind of just ran out of steam this week, but maybe I will. There were certain songs that I really fixated on. And I would listen to the song in an obsessive and really weird way, especially when I was very frustrated and down. And I thought, I'm not going to be able to finish the story, and I'm never going to finish this book. It, wrote, it took me quite a while. Um, I listened to a lot of Rhiannon Gibbons, um, the second album that she had. Um, I listened to a lot of Linda Ronstadt for Hal Palace. Um, and I listened to um, some Eagles for Hell Palace in an obsessive and weird way. Um, uh, I'm, and I listened to, there was a lot of Linda Ronstadt. I mean a lot, like way more. I did a big deep dive. And there were some songs I would just, I would literally listen to the same song over and again ten times before I began to write. Then I would turn off the record. And then I would write for three hours. And then if I got stuck... I would go back to the record and play the same song 10 times and then go back to write. I don't know what that was doing for me, but I felt like it was kind of mesmerizing me. I felt like I had to get in some fugue state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've done so much work as an editor. Yeah. So much amazing work as an editor. And I was, and I, you know, this, this thing, I feel like, I feel like we're mutants when you're like a writer and an editor. Yeah. Uh, how did you bring that? You know, did you find yourself fighting yourself, uh, the editor side of yourself, or did you feel like it's an asset when you were working on this book? I think the editorial really helped me become a better writer, because as I began to like chop apart people's I, books, I wasn't working so much in short stories at that time or essays at Oprah. Like I began to see like forms and templates on how to move things around, and then I began to. The actually the most helpful thing ever to me was my editor um, at Dial during my memoir, and she's Jennifer E. Smith. I think her book might be here, The Unsinkable Greta James. She just wrote her first adult book. I don't, it's over there. And she sat me down and she's like, part one is um, you're happy and you live in Alaska. Part two is you don't know who you are or where you learn. Part three is home. I mean, they're just asinine subtitles, right? But I was like, oh, every section needs a direction. That's... And then they build on each other, and that's what you call a story arc. Duh. You know what I mean? But, um, and then I started really thinking about form differently. So it was more like listening to the other editors who were talking to me that way, and then starting to edit myself and being, and just talking to have the same kind of conversations with writers that I could apply to myself. You know? It's not been about, the struggle has not been about sentences for me. The struggle has been about how to create story. I feel like, one thing that my editorial work actually did was make it easier for me to turn the editor off while I'm writing. I yeah. sort of like developed my sort of editorial like super ego or whatever to such a degree that it's like it's it's a it's it's a presence that can now be like removed. I think mm. I I realized how much of the process happens after the first draft is written, 
Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's allowed me the freedom to just turn that voice off, write the first draft, and create the material that then becomes the material of the editorial process. I'm not quite able to do that, but I do think it's also given me confidence. So one thing I really lacked is I would yell at myself so much about not being a good writer that I would actually stop writing and I would also like write for eight hours and throw everything out at the end of the day, like literally delete it or throw it away. But as an editor, like getting confidence about telling other people what to do and seeing it very clearly, like just being so like being like, oh, this is what needs to be done. You clean that up and then send it back to me and we'll all go to the National Book Awards together. How does that feel? <laughs> That's never really happened, but... Um, <laughs> Then I feel like I gave me a lot of confidence. Like, yeah, maybe you do know what you're doing. You know, a little. You know, you'll never know, no, but you'll know a little bit. You'll know it enough to like finish the paragraph and not throw it out. Also, as an editor, you read a lot of really bad stuff. I know it's <laughs> super good. And there's actually something I to be said for love that. it. Actually, yeah. that is. I was, I was yeah. thinking that when you asked that question. Yeah. It's true. Sometimes you're there, like this person put no effort in. None. Yeah. Zero. They have zero ear. Yeah. Like they don't even, this is just like, you know, cement on the page and they chopped it up and then they threw it over here. And it's like a number one bestseller. And then I'm like, that's great for them. They're doing something different. But I'm like, oh, I am. I'm better than them. I can yeah. keep going. That's a terrible, nasty, awful little thought. <laughs> it's yeah. awful. I, I had a professor who said that the problem for, for students is that when you're like, an undergrad. Yeah. You're reading, you know, oh, yeah. Henry James. Oh and my God, whenever Mann I read The and, Vagrants and, by yeah. Yulian, I'm like, just stop and yeah. go home. But, and she, <laughs> and she was like, you should read uh, not just your peer student work, yeah. but even read like a lot of what is being published in contemporary, you know, by professional writers that, that, that probably won't stand the test of time. But I don't even care but, about that anymore. I'm just trying to see what they're doing. I read so much. The stack of my books is like, it's gotten to be one of those things where it's like, I think I thought it was decor at some point, but now there's like a stack on my bedside, then there's a stack on my dresser, and there's a stack in the living room, and then there's like whole shelves of it like to be read, and then piles on the floor. My children can attest to this. But I, I, I don't usually read to feel like that I'm confident in someone else's, and I usually read because I'm like, what are they doing and how are they doing it? Like, um, I just read this great book called Virtue by Hermione Hobie. And I think I've like scared her a little bit because I've been like, I love your book on Instagram. I love your book on Facebook. And then I saw her casually at, the, at this thing last night and I was like, I love your book and let me tell you why. Let me dig out my index cards. <laughs> she was like, okay, that's great. Um, but I wanted to see like, she does a lot of lavishing, writing from love and with lots of adjectives and a lot of the things I do. But she was able to carry this arc across about um, a, a young person with not very much experience being dazzled by like New York wealth and, and how that, you know, in a very kind of Gatsby kind of yeah. way. Um, yeah, I want to see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I want to see what I can take or twist and make from that. But I, I have to say it's one of the most exciting things still when you read something that actually, where that, it, that turns that off. Where yeah. you, you act, you just feel in it. And, and, yeah. and, and I will say honestly, um, you know, I'd read all these stories already, as I said, when they came out, and I had this, you know, I was reading them with the aim of having this conversation, so I had very much the analytical, yeah. like, mind as I was going into this reading of it, um, and at a certain point, that all just got turned off, because oh, I'm so it's glad. just so, it's so good that you stop asking yourself those questions. <laughs> I feel the same way about your novel, you guys. I, some, I, I reread his novel, because I wanted it to be, like, super smart when I was in this conversation. <laughs> I was jumping into bed the last five days. I did not get the second reading. I only got to about like 240. Um, but it is, it's a great like sprawling, all these characters, all these storylines and you're never confused and you're always like, you know, who's going to fall in love with whom? And who's going to make this really bad decision? I don't know. I, I loved it. Thank okay. You. Well, um, thank yes. I have a question. Yes, Carrie. What were you reading while you were writing this? You're talking about all these books. All I read was short stories for six years. I read every book of stories that came out. I read every book of stories that had been written in the 80s and the 90s. I just, what I thought was, um, if I'm going to learn how to do it, there's like going to be forms. And yeah. some of those forms I'm going to be able to glean from dissecting the story or breaking it down as I read and seeing what they're doing. And some I will just be able to get through osmosis. If I'm just reading that all the time, those forms will sort of like suture themselves into my brain. And um, I actually, it was really fun. 
Yeah. I read so much Edna O'Brien. Oh. I read so much Charles D'Ambrosio. I read Gorilla My Love like 500 times. Um, I read Molly Antipole. I mean, I was calling those the whole time the mother stories. And by mother story, I mean like you reach the end of the day and you're like, you look at the word the and you're like, the. Yeah. It's such a weird word. And you're like, I think I'm overusing it. I'm repping, I'm repeating the too many times, you know? And you're like, what's it all mean? And then you go read the mother story, you read the Dead Fish Museum or something, and you're like, oh, okay, it's just spatula. It's just a station wagon. It's just a dude, you know, in a mental hospital with a lighter. It's okay. We can go tomorrow with all those words. Um, I think we have to. I think we're done. There. I think we. So there's a party. Woohoo! And you're but all But before invited. the party. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Leah is going to sign books. Yes. Which I have to make sure. Yay! Yay. Yes, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, as Chris said, Lee is going to be signing in the back, so if you could give her just a few minutes to get settled and then make your way back there. There's also a door where you can exit back there, and we do ask that you start to make your way back so that our staff can start to break down the space and get the store back to its usual form. So thank you all again so much for coming. Let's give a big round of applause again to Lee and Chris. Can you take a picture of us by the um, podium? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You gotta unfold it. You know who can get into my phone?